Hi, Tom. Uh, thank you for coming today. We're here to speak about your Credo series, a Catholic catechetical curriculum for high school students and hopefully then for use in youth ministry programs as well. But before we get into the series, I'd like to ask just a few general questions, if you don't mind. Sure, Steve. Wonderful. Many of my childhood friends, including those who went to parochial school with me, no longer have any discernible affiliation with the church. And I think it's kind of a sad but familiar story these days. And I wonder if you could just comment, what's going wrong? Well, I think at least two things I think of, Steve. One is that the conditions of society have changed drastically, and in some ways away from faith rather than toward faith. I mean, the old cultures that you and I grew up in disposed us toward faith. You couldn't grow up in my Irish village and not have become uh, a Catholic, and a very Irish Catholic, because it was in the, it was in the culture, it was in the, in the language patterns. I, I think it was in the water. Uh, and so we were enculturated into that faith, and the old parishes, you know, with a full convent of sisters and a plenty of priests in the rectory and a ca vibrant Catholic school, and then all kinds of organizations and sodalities and, and societies and what have you. I mean, it was a great Catholic culture that enculturated people into Christian and into Catholic identity. In many ways, those conditions are gone. And, uh, you know, Charles Taylor, the great uh, analyst of contemporary society, when he talks about a secular age, there's three senses of, of, of secularization. One is the separation of church and state, which is a good positive thing, as Pope Benedict often pointed out during his visit to this country. Uh, a second one is a falling off of religious practice. Now, that's more ominous because if you stop practicing, you'll stop believing pretty soon. But Taylor says the third sense of, social, of, uh, of, um, uh, of, of us being secularized, the third sense of secularization, is that the conditions of society have changed and in many ways have changed away from faith rather than toward faith, and very often not for bad reasons. Some of it is just the advances in medical science. If I could give a personal example, when I was about four years old, I came down with pneumonia. I lived on an Irish farm. I was the youngest of 10 children. My father was away in Dublin in, in, the, in, the, in the parliament. And my mother was home alone a winter's night that had already lost a little daughter to pneumonia a few years prior. Uh, to harness up a horse and buggy and try to get a sick child in a winter's night to a doctor 10 miles away would have been hazardous. So what did she do? Well, as she told the story herself, she knelt down beside my bed and she told God that she wasn't leaving there until my fever broke. Now, I fell asleep, she fell asleep, I woke up, my mom woke up, my fever had broken. Now, she went to her grave swearing that that was a miracle. The point I want to make is her granddaughters would never do that. They'd never do what their grandmother did. Do you know what they'd do instead? As you know well, They'd pop the kid in the SUV and they'd be in the village in 10 minutes who would get a course of penicillin or antibiotic and would be running around in a few days. In other words, we don't need God, or so we can assume, the way we used to. And not only did my mother do that, but she also told the story of doing that over and over and over ad nauseum in some ways. But we grew up hearing that story. And the story, as well as her faith, nurtured our identity in faith. We don't have those kind of stories anymore. So the conditions of society have changed. The second thing that I think we have to be honest about is that the Catholic Church has found enormously effective ways of driving people away. And I think we have to honestly recognize this. The last Pew report indicated there's something like 30 million people in the United States now identify themselves as former Catholics. Now, what are we doing that is so effective in driving so many good people away? And the statistics indicate that 74% of them end up joining other Christian uh, communions of faith. In other words, these are not people who lose their faith. And when they're asked why they leave, uh, over 70% of them say they leave the Catholic Church because this church is no longer meeting their spiritual needs. Now, I think that's enough to make a big person cry because there's no richer spiritual tradition than Catholic Christianity.
there's nothing more uh, lavish and more resourceful and, and more of, of a tremendous treasury uh, than what we have by way of spiritual practices and charisms and traditions. And as I often say, if you don't like one, you can pick another. If you don't like the Ignatian, you can pick the Carmelite or the Benedictine or the Franciscan or whatever is your pleasure. I mean, for people to be leaving this church because their spiritual needs are not, me not being met, it's just tragic. So in other words, the church has to face there are certain things we're doing that are driving people away. And I always say it's better to bring people along than to drive them away. And we're talking about issues and things that I think in the hierarchy of Catholic truths are very near the bottom rather than near the top. And I think this is maybe what Pope Francis is trying to do for the church. And that is to stop talking about these things that aren't that significant to our faith and yet are pushing people away and instead begin to talk about, well, what Pope Benedict talked about as a positive orthodoxy to be able to present this faith in ways that say, hey, this is a fantastic way to live your life. You can find no better way to live your life than the way modeled by Jesus of Nazareth. And when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, he wasn't kidding. And not only did he model it, but we believe by his dying and rising made it possible. So it's a great way to live, but we don't talk about it that way. We present it as do's and don'ts and all the controversial issues. We're out there, you know, our official church, most of our membership don't agree with the official, uh, official church on those controversial issues, like birth control, for example. And yet we're still shouting about it, and in many ways simply driving people away. Far better to bring them along. What does the buzz phrase new evangelization mean to you? The new evangelization is actually very old. It's as old as the church itself. It just, in many ways, we had lost the sense of evangelization. It all began, as you know well, on that hillside in Galilee, uh, Matthew 28, when the risen Christ gathered the little remnant church and he gave everybody present the great ultimate evangelizing mandate. Go out to all the nations and proclaim the good news and go out and teach all nations and teach them to observe all that I have commanded you. You know, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. In other words, take them into the community and I will be with you always till the end of time. The point I would like to make about that text, Matthew 28, 16 and the following, is that he gave that mandate to everybody there present. In other words, the responsibility to share this Christian faith of ours comes with baptism. It's not as if some people are to share it and other people are to receive it. We're all to be agents of our faith rather than just simply recipients. And um, over time, we came to reduce evangelization. Well, the typical meaning was about bringing people into the church and especially sending missionaries off to Africa or Asia or some place that had not been already Christianized to get them to get people to join the church. Now, that's a valid meaning of evangelization. But in a sense, the new evangelization, the emphasis is not so much on bringing people into the church as bringing people out of the church, out of the church and into the world, into the marketplace of life with a vibrant, joyful, uh, life-giving faith that is worth sharing and that everybody has this responsibility to take their faith and to put it to work in the ordinary and everyday of life, in the marketplace of life uh, and, and in, the, in the public square of life. And you see, we've been often been, and you see, we're all in need. We're all supposed to be evangelists, so we all are to evangelize, but we're also constantly in need of evangelization. In other words, my faith journey is lifelong. So it's not as if I've reached a point of arrival and I can rest on my oars. No, our hearts will always be restless until they rest in God as Augustine would have it. So in a sense, all of us are evangelists, all of us need evangelization. And I think the, the other emphasis that I'd love to raise up out of the new evangelization is that, you see, we've been very hesitant at times about proselytizing. Oh, we don't want to impose our faith on anybody else, or I would never want to interfere with your faith, or you know, that's all your, your private personal choice and so on. But the new evangelization helps us to distinguish between proselytizing and evangelizing. I think proselytizing is telling other people what they should believe. Evangelizing is telling people what you believe or we believe. Evangelizing is sharing your faith, not imposing it. Uh, proselytizing is imposing. 
And there's no place for proselytizing. There's a wonderful line, it's 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, verse 15, I believe, um, where Peter says, always be ready to explain the hope, and of course the hope is based on faith that is in you, but do it with respect and with reverence. So we always have to approach other people with respect and reverence instead of imposing our faith or telling them who they ought to be and what they should be and how to believe and where to go and how to get there. We're always entitled to share our faith. And I have found myself on planes, trains, buses, uh, having a beer, uh, strangers I meet as often as not, um, people who give me an opening, tell me some of their troubles. I had somebody do it recently on an airplane, start into his, tell me his troubles, and the man had a great deal of troubles. And in the middle of it, I said to him, I said, you know, I could never bear the pain and the, and the suffering that you're carrying if I didn't have faith. And he said, what do you mean? And then I proceeded to tell him how my faith sustains me in the ordinary and everyday of life. The man came to tears. He says, you know, I went to a Jesuit high school. I should know that stuff myself. But he'd grown away from his faith. We had a fantastic, a spectacular conversation. I would never say to him, now you should be going to church or you should be going, or you should. But I told him that I go to church and I pray daily. Uh, I shared my faith with him. Uh, and by all accounts, uh, he went away deeply touched by our conversation. At least this was his claim, and I had no reason not to believe him. So we all have these opportunities every day we live uh, to bring a word of faith, a word of hope, a word of love, a word of mercy, compassion into the situation, and we're entitled to do that. We're not only entitled to do it, I think we're commissioned to do it by our baptism. What distinguishes evangelization from catechesis, and why are both important? I think evangelization in, con in, in conversation with catechesis, I see them as two end, or as a continuum, and of course they have no end. They may have a beginning, but there is no end until we finally rest in God, as we just said. I think evangelization is that initial conversion, that moment when somebody says, you know, I need God in my life, or um, I think this Jesus uh, was an amazing person, and maybe I should model myself on the way he, the way he lived and how, 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 what he taught. Or a person says, you know, or has a, de has a spiritual experience or a spiritual crisis, uh, finds themselves uh, helpless in the face of alcohol or drugs or something and have that moment, that conversion moment, when they realize that they're not going to make it without higher power. So you, you can think of examples of that, that turning point in people's lives when there is a turning toward faith. Now I think, at least in the, in the early church, the evangelistes, the evangelists, they were the ones who went out and kind of preached just the basic kerygma of Christian faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. In a sense, they just put out the, the kind of the, the, um, a summary, a tidbit, uh, the tip of the iceberg, and got people interested, got them curious. Uh, or there were witnesses by, to a life of justice and uh, works of corporal works of mercy. Uh, and people said, now, what drives those Christians? Why do they love other people so much and so well? And not just their own members, but anybody in need. You know, the great marks of the early Christian community. They helped anybody in need. So when people saw that, they sometimes became curious and began to inquire. And then that was the, that in many ways, that was, the, that was evangelization. When they began to inquire about it and to be formed in it, they needed what I would call catechesis. And that's what catechesis, as the general directory for catechesis describes it, is the maturing of the faith that began with evangelization, but then needs formation, information, and of course, lifelong transformation, lifelong conversion into holiness of life. So we'll all, we're always in need of catechesis. The general directory for catechesis, again, talks about permanent, lifelong catechesis. Uh, evangelization is kind of that initial conversion moment, but then it needs both. So in a sense, the distinction between them is, is rather subtle. They're two sides of the same coin. They can't function without each other uh, because you can catechize people all you like. Uh, 
But if they've never had that kind of personal turning to God, and maybe for Christian faith, turning to God in Jesus Christ, if that was never there, they're just, uh, they'll end up as theologians maybe. <laughs> I shouldn't say that, since most of my best friends are good theologians. But you can end up, in other words, knowing about it uh, through catechesis. But, oh, if it's to become your identity, and uh, if you're to learn from it and embrace it as your identity, uh, that needs a conversion moment, I think, or a conversion process, perhaps. It may not be a particular moment. It can be over time. But uh, I think the emphasis in, in there is, con is in, in evangelization is conversion. The emphasis in catechesis is more information, formation, transformation. You've written that Christian discipleship is primarily discipleship to Jesus the Christ, and that both the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith must be emphasized. Why is it important to emphasize both? You see, the Jesus Christ is well named, and we need both. We need the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. We need the fellow who walked the roads, the carpenter of Galilee. And we need the Christ, the risen one, the son of God, the second person of the blessed Trinity uh, to be our Lord and savior. And I would, I would say, I, would, I, I think I'm right in this, that Catholic Christians especially have generally neglected the Jesus of history. The Christ of faith we're big on, you know, the son of God and our Lord and savior and so on. But the Jesus of history, we, step, we overlooked him. We, we stepped over him. We left him out. And there's a whole explanation as to why. Now, there's many reasons as to why. But one of them is that the old catechisms, like the Catechism of Trent, and then all of the catechisms that follow thereafter, the National Catechisms, the Baltimore Catechism, the Maynooth Catechism, Westminster Catechism, and so on, they all, the, the doctrinal uh, section of those catechisms were, was all based on the Apostles' Creed where they took each article of the creed and catechized it. So I believe in God, the Father Almighty. Then the question was, who is God? God's our Father in heaven, and so on. But remember, the creed says, the, uh, the article, born of the Virgin Mary, the very next article is, suffered under Pontius Pilate. In other words, we left out his life from his birth to his death. So there isn't a word in the Baltimore Catechism about the multiplication of the loaves and fishes, the, 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 the healing of the sick, the including of the marginalized, the presence of women as fully participating members of his discipleship and so on. Not a word about it. We skip the Jesus of history. And one of the, ten, one of the great, I think, uh, and of course as Catholic Christians, we didn't read our Bible nearly the way our Protestant brothers and sisters did. So in a sense, we didn't have direct access to the, to the Jesus of history either. We didn't read the Gospels. And in our liturgy, uh, you know, before, now I'm talking about before a Second Vatican Council, but there's a very limited uh, cycle of readings. There's a one-year cycle, and sometimes they got read, sometimes they were read in Latin. Very often, it was the Catechism of Trent that got preached rather than the reading of the, of the Gospel of the Sunday. So basically, Catholics missed out on the Jesus of history. The same way with the rosary. Uh, the, in many ways, the rosary was the operative Christology for many lay Catholics. But the, the, the fifth joyful mystery is the finding in the temple when he was 12 years old. The next mystery uh, is, the, is the, uh, the, the agony in the garden first sorrowful mystery. So we went from when he was 12 to when he was dying, which I thought it was significant when Pope John Paul II introduced five, five luminous mysteries, all of them focusing on the public life of Jesus. So for Catholic Christians especially, we have to return to Jesus. We have to turn to Jesus. We have to fix our eyes on him. And in many ways, I think that's what Pope Francis is doing for us. He's bringing us to the Jesus of history, to this fellow who favored the least, the lost, and the last. And, and included the marginalized and, and uh, welcomed the sinners and compassion for all and fed the hungry. Only two miracles reported six times in the Gospels, the resurrection and the miracle of the loaves and fishes. Six times in all four Gospels, and then twice in Matthew, twice in Mark. It must have been central to his public ministry, feeding hungry people. And then, of course, if you say you're a disciple, hey, guess what you've got to do? So in other words, we've got to reclaim discipleship to Jesus Christ. When we think about being Catholic, we have to think of it first and foremost, not as joining the church. I have a friend who recently became Catholic, and I said to him, what does that mean for you? He says, well, I'm joining the church. I said, no, 
you're becoming a disciple of Jesus. And then to do that, well, of course, you'll need a church. And you need a church with, with great stories to tell and sacraments to celebrate and, and uh, models to propose and, and uh, people to pray with and support you and dogmas and doctrines to understand your faith and so on. But becoming a Catholic is not about, about joining the church. It's about becoming a disciple of Jesus, first and foremost. And this is what the Catechism says. The Catechism of the Catholic Church puts it beautifully. It says, at the, it says it, that the heart of our faith is not the Bible. It's not the sacraments. It's not the commandments. It's not the church. It says, at the heart, we find a person. The per I love how the Catechism puts it. It's paragraph 426, I believe. At the heart, we find a person, the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the only son from the Father. In other words, we need the Jesus of Nazareth, that carpenter walking the roads, proclaiming the coming of God's reign, hospitality to all, and, and, and care for the, 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 the sick and the, and the lost and the lame and, and the, the, the sinners and so on. But then we need the Christ of faith, that indeed by his paschal mystery, his dying and rising, that indeed, as Paul puts it so often, we now ex can experience God's abundant grace that enables us to live as disciples. So we need the grace of God to live as disciples. But that we refocus on both the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith is imperative. And I, at this point in time, all of the, all of the great uh, research being done by New Testament scholars uh, you know, Low Fink, Pagola, Crossan, Myers, uh, they're all Catholic, looking at the Jesus of history. Who was he? What did he want? As Low Fink uh, puts it in his book, um, I think it's a kind of a new moment for our faith. And I do believe that, that it's in the Jesus of history that we can rediscover the most persuasive apologetic for Catholic faith. You've said that Christian discipleship pertains to one's whole being, and I believe the way you express it is head, heart, and hands. What kind of catechesis must be used to address this kind of total life commitment? Well, you see, so often we've thought about faith as simply our beliefs. But the old tradition, I mean going back again to the Jesus of history, is that this faith engages well, as he put it with the great commandment, all our heads, our hearts, and our, our, all, our, all our mind, heart, and strength. As I would say, all our heads, our hearts, and our hands. So it requires the whole person. It's not just our beliefs. Now, the notion that faith can be reduced to belief in many ways is a product of the Reformation, which in many, is very understandable because many of the beliefs were challenged. So do we believe in seven sacraments or two sacraments? Is it faith and good works or, or faith alone that saves and so on and so forth? So, pardon me, a lot of the beliefs got challenged and then we began to emphasize belief as the core of faith. The Catechism of Trent defines faith as unhe unhesitating assent to the teachings of the church. That's its definition of faith. Of course, there's a belief aspect to faith. There's a cognitive aspect to faith. Uh, there's an intellectual aspect of faith. But it can't be just for our heads. It has to be for our hearts. It has to be for our spirituality, for our relationships, our relationship with God, our relationship with ourselves, with others, with God's creation, the prayers we say, the worship we mount. But it can't be just for the head and heart. It has to be for our hands as well. In other words, the commitments, the ethic by which we live, uh, the, 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 uh, the good thing, the good we do, in our lives. So in a sense, it has to be lived, but it has to be trusted and it has to be believed. So it's, it's the whole person. And Karl Rahner said that in many ways, the church, you see, could write a catechism. After you define faith as belief, then all you need to do, in a sense, is summarize the beliefs. But Rahner said what happened at Vatican II and what in many ways broke open a new day for catechesis was that we reclaimed a more holistic understanding of faith. And so if, if you're going to talk about faith being uh, cognitive, affective, and behavioral, rather than simply cognitive alone, then the catechesis that would encourage such a holistic faith has to engage not just people's heads, but their hearts and their hands, their commitments as well. So in a sense, you have to connect faith with people's ordinary everyday lives in ways that touch that touches their souls, that goes into the depths of them. 
and into who they are and nurtures their identity rather than just teaching them uh, what to believe. Uh, so it, it's a new day for catechesis, which is part of the challenge of it that in many ways we didn't have in another, in a previous time. Also on the topic of discipleship, it's always intrigued me that the Greek word mathetes, which is rendered in the New Testament as disciple, can also very rightly be translated as an apprentice who listens. And I wonder if you could comment on what role listening plays in faith formation. I think that listening is imperative to faith formation and, of course, opening our hearts to receive the Word of God uh, is imperative. Uh, as uh, Psalm 91, I believe, puts it, if today you hear God's voice, harden not your heart. So in a sense, all of us have to be constantly open uh, to the possibility of a word of God touching our lives. However, it may come to us, of course, the scriptures are the privileged medium of God's word touching our lives. But even before we hear a reading of the scriptures, we need to pause and open our hearts to receive it, to listen to it, to hear it, to ab audire, the old Latin for, for to hear means in many ways to turn the ear, but it's to, it means to, to take it to heart and to obey it. So we're called to, to hear it in a way that leads us to obey it. Now, however, and so the listening for God's word is imperative, but you see, I would say in our time that part of the challenge is not just simply telling people and getting people to listen. I think we have to move them into agency for their faith. Rather than being simply recipients, listeners to it, I think they have to become actively engaged in the process of encountering the faith. In other words, my job as a catechist is to give people ready access, which is a, f a lovely phrase from the Second Vatican Council, to the Word of God. But that will often mean not just telling them what the Word is, but bringing them to the Word and getting them to bring their lives to the Word and to, to then discern how this word could be a word of God for their lives, uh, for themselves, so that people come to see for themselves. So rather than simply being told, now of course there's room for proclamation, there's room for telling uh, and preaching and teaching and so on. And yet I think in this day and age, we're called beyond that simple proclamation to enabling people to become agents of their own faith and to give them the, the tools and the, the resources uh, to go to the word and to go to the tradition and to encounter it uh, heart to heart and come to see for themselves uh, what's their, where they're called and how they're called to live their faith rather than simply being told. Is it more difficult to listen fruitfully to the story of Christian faith with all of the distractions inherent in our postmodern world? I think our postmodern world offers great challenges uh, to people coming to faith, to people hearing the faith, encountering the faith, taking the faith to heart. Uh, I mean, the first mandate in any process of knowing anything is to pay attention. It's increasingly more difficult, I suppose, with all of the distractions that we have to get people to pay attention. A friend of mine who runs a retreat center uh, for young people, and uh, often has six, seven hundred young people on a weekend in his retreat center down in Long Island, he says that his biggest challenge is just trying to get them to stay off the, the iPhones. He says Friday evening, they usually put them aside, but by mid-morning Saturday, they're there looking up at you, but really texting each other, the person beside them. Uh, how do you break into that? Well, we, we, first of all, this is not going to go away. So the digital age and all of the modern means of communication are here to stay. And the good Catholic attitude toward them is, thank God. Now, they could bury us or there could be a new moment. I think we have to learn how to take these media and distractions, as we call them, and turn them into assets and, and, and resources for ways that could give people more ready access to the Word of God, uh, that they, they're not as dependent, they can be agents of their own faith and so on. So there's certainly a huge level of distraction, but I think 
an old spiritual director I had one time uh, when I was told him about my distractions at prayer. He said, Tom, you've got to start praying your distractions. In other words, when you get distracted, well, start talking to God about the distractions. So you're focusing a scripture text and you start thinking about, you know, a friend who is sick. Well, hey, start praying for your friend who is sick. So in a sense, we've got to learn how to take what could be distractions and turn them to assets. And I think the contemporary media has the extraordinary potential uh, for doing that. In a related question, what are some of the distinguishing characteristics of 21st century learners? And if we want to get even more particular, the distinguishing characteristics of 21st century high school aged learners? See, we have a new type of learner, there's no doubt about it, than we had even 50 years ago, never mind 500 years ago. Um, and we all wring our hands about postmodernity and secularization and so on. But, and there are definite challenges in the secularizing age and the postmodern world, etc. But there are also assets. There's also potential and possibility here. Like uh, the postmoderns are much more disposed and open to the spiritual than modernity was. For modernity, anything to do with faith, spirituality was simply considered uh, the, the superstition of your grandparents. And as soon as you got a bit of enlightenment, you'd, you'd put them aside. So the great critics, Marx, uh, Freud, Nietzsche, and so on, they all looked upon faith and spirituality with great disparagement. Postmodernity takes a very different tack. Uh, postmodern, postmodernity, the classic instance of it is these young people who will say regularly, I'm spiritual, but not religious. Now, what they mean is, you know, I have a sense of God and of the transcendent in my life, but I'm not interested in going to church, is very often what they're saying. I see that as a positive, or as at least a positive we could build upon. When young people say to me, I'm spiritual, but not religious, I always say, that's a fantastic beginning because we've got a tremendous spirituality to offer you. And you know what? You can't go on being spiritual very long unless you've got real resources to sustain you on the journey. You're going to need a, 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 a great story upon which to draw. You're going to need rituals and sacraments and a community of faith and models and practices to sustain your spiritual journey. You can't make it up as you go along, nor do you need to. There's great spiritual traditions that have sustained people's spirituality in very life-giving ways for thousands of years, and there's none better than Catholic Christian faith for doing that. So, in other words, you, you have to begin where they are, but then say to them, hey, you're going to need more than that, and we've got something wonderful to offer you. So I think there's potential and possibilities in this postmodern age that we didn't have in modernity, really. Uh, and there's other examples as well. There's an openness and respect, for example, for the other. Uh, basically, modernity wanted to make everybody the same, and, and everybody would be saved when they became the same as us. In other words, when, when people the far side of the world in Africa took on European culture, then they'd have a good life, and then they would have democracy and so on. So th there was very little respect for our appreciation for peoples who were other, who were different from us. Post-modernity is highly respectful of the other and welcoming of the other. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I think uh, our younger people have much more toleration for diversity uh, all across the board uh, in ways that their parents and grandparents didn't have at all. So, so there's potential in postmodernity, I believe, uh, for a rich faith, uh, a rich Christian faith, but we will have to connect it to their lives. If it doesn't ring true, to their lives, if it doesn't seem like a real asset to their lives, they will definitely put it aside. Uh, because in their own quest for authenticity, that's another great feature that uh, Taylor talks about as, as uh, kind of defining our postmodern age, this quest for authenticity. But a lot of the times, it's kind of as a buffered self, as Taylor says. It's kind of a self that places themselves within the cocoon of their own thinking, of their own desires, of their own, they become the measure of their own being. In many ways, they become, we become our own God. And you see, I think we have a powerful 
uh, good news for young people in that quest for authenticity to say, hey, the quest for authenticity to be the best person and the truest person you can possibly be is a tremendous quest, but you'll never make it by yourself. It can't be done by yourself. You'll need a community. You'll need a tradition. You need wisdom. You need uh, something more than just your own thoughts and feelings. You can go crazy if you limit yourself to that. So I think there's potential and possibility in post-modernity that we actually, for faith, that we didn't have a modernity, but it will have to deeply connect to their lives. Because saying to them, oh, it'll get you to heaven. This generation is interested in going to college next year, but heaven, uh, they'll hold off on. Or it'll send you to hell. They don't believe it. Now, there was a time when the church basically, its apologetic on behalf of Christian faith was basically, basically fear of punishment or promise of reward. Uh, that won't work anymore, not with this generation. I think we can do better. Jesus was often addressed as a rabbi or a teacher. Can we discern the pedagogical style of Jesus from the Gospels? And if so, how has Jesus' method of teaching influenced your own work? I think we can detect the pedagogy of Jesus, and especially in his public ministry. I mean, he's referred to as a teacher, as teaching, something like 150 times. So it was his primary function, and not only by what he said, but also by how, what he did. And I think his constant dynamic, at least that I detect in his pedagogy, is one of leading people from life to faith and from faith to life. And he did it regularly. He did it, the hundreds of examples, and especially in the parables. But he would typically begin with people's own lives. The reign of God is like fishermen sorting fish. The reign of God is like merchants in search of fine pearls. The reign of God is like a sore who went out to sow some seed. The reign of God is like a woman baking bread. The rain, the, or, or just look at the birds of the air. Look at the lilies of the field. The, 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 the mustard seed, the, the wheat and the tares growing side by side. The poor beggar at the rich person's gate. I mean, uh, uh, farmers or, or uh, vine, vin, uh, vineyard owners going out looking for workers. I mean, these were common life themes and praxis of people's daily lives. He'd begin there. But then very often he taught them to, to see those lives in a whole new way. So the, 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 the Samaritan becomes the neighbor, the prodigal is welcomed home, the beggar uh, goes home to Abraham and uh, the rich man to hell because uh, that would have turned people's world upside down in the world of the time. Uh, health and wealth was taken as a blessing from God for what life well lived and the poverty was taken as a punishment. So getting people to see in a whole new way and yet he also taught them with authority. He wasn't just a discussion leader getting the people to look at their lives and reflect on them. He also taught them uh, as it said, with, with, well, it says right at the beginning of Mark's gospel that he taught them with authority, in chapter 1, verse 21-22. Um, and you see, the, he was teaching that this inbreaking of God's reign, that now is the time of fulfillment. Uh, the reign of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Change your lives. He had a powerful message for people. But he brought, it began with our lives, shared this powerful gospel, this good news with them, but then constantly invited them to bring that faith back into their lives as a lived life, as a lived faith. Uh, and and uh, inviting them to decision. All the parables, uh, in a sense, are a call to decision, to, to, to live it or not to live it. It's, it's, it's writ large, it's, it's all throughout his public uh, life, I believe, that life to faith to life, I think it's writ large on the road to Emmaus. Now it's the risen Christ, of course. But when you look at that text in Luke uh, 24, verses 13 to 35, um, he, the, the, these two bewildered disciples, traumatized, are stumbling out of Jerusalem, and they've given up hope. They admit that uh, later on, that we were hoping. Uh, but you can imagine their pain, their distraction, and in the midst of their lively exchange, the text says, Jesus himself approached and began to walk along with them. And they're restrained from recognizing him. Now, the scripture scholars, speak, well, any of us can imagine, uh, why didn't they recognize him? But the better question, I think, catechetically, is why didn't he introduce himself? I mean, why didn't he just simply say, hey, I'm the risen Christ? He never tells them what to see. Instead, he asks them, what are you discussing? as you go upon your way. In other words, tell me your story. Tell me your vision. And they say to him, are you the only one who doesn't know the things that went on in Jerusalem? And he says, what things? Now let's agree. Nobody knew better than he what went on in Jerusalem these past few days. 
And yet he wants them to tell him their story and their shattered vision. He begins with their life, what's going on. And they say all the things that had to do with Jesus of Nazareth, the prophet, powerful in the eyes of God and all the people, how we were hoping he was the one who set Israel free. Besides all this, some of our women went to the tomb before dawn, came back with this amazing story that he's risen. Some of the men went to the tomb. They saw nothing. So basically, we're getting out of there. So in a sense, he gets their own story and vision on the table. And only then does he begin to explain the scriptures to them. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interprets for them every passage of scripture that referred to himself and explained that the Messiah had to so suffer so as to enter into his glory. So in a sense, he set up a dialectic. They were hoping for a political Messiah to set Israel free. He's talking about a suffering servant Messiah. So there's a bit of a tension here now, but you've got their own life on the table. You've got the faith handed down on the table. He still doesn't tell them what to see but waits for them to come to see for themselves, which they do when he seats himself with them at table. He takes it regarding the bread. He takes it, blesses it, breaks it, gives it. With that, their eyes are open. They're the same four verbs as the Last Supper. And their eyes are open and they recognize them. And, and they, they see for themselves who it is, which, of course, whereupon he vanishes from their sight. But you see, having seen for themselves who the risen Christ was, they turn around and they go back to Jerusalem because they've got to go back into a renewed faith, a reappropriated faith. It's a wonderful example of, now it's a great example of a liturgical text, of course. Uh, the liturgy of the word is on the road, the liturgy of Eucharist at the table, but it's a powerful catechetical text and the dynamics of it. He led them from their lives to the faith tradition and then to see for themselves and to come back into a life of faith, to return to Jerusalem and to their original commitment. How would you describe your shared Christian praxis approach to religious education, which permeates the Credo series? Uh, I think the, the pedagogy of shared Christian praxis is indeed the pedagogy of bringing life to faith and bringing faith to life in faith. So that dynamic of life to faith to life that's on, an ongoing cycle is precisely the pedagogy that runs all throughout the Credo series. And it's the one that I suppose I've given my life to and trying to uh, promote it, encourage it, uh, educate people in it, uh, figure out how to do it effectively all across the board. I've, I've written a kindergarten book and I've written uh, doctoral doctoral PhD seminar texts, and uh, the work has been used across the board as a consistent approach, enabling people, you see, the Second Vatican Council in uh, Gaudium et Spes, I believe it was paragraph 43, said, the greatest error, one of the greatest errors of our age is, now you think in 1965, they'd say communism, or materialism, or consumerism, or individualism, Instead, they said one of the greatest errors of our age is the gap the Christians maintain between the lives we live and the faith we profess. And I remember reading that as a young seminarian many years ago in Ireland and saying, you know, that's it. This separation of life from faith. We've got to bring them together. Uh, and unless we bring them together, people won't but won't be interested, people won't be engaged by it, people won't be changed by it, people won't live it. So that integration of life and faith for contemporary catechesis is simply imperative. I think we find a great model of it in Jesus of Nazareth. I think the, the, the whole shared Christian praxis approach that I've, I'm so, so, so I suppose, uh, associated with so widely, uh, it's basically an attempt to do that. Can you walk us through a practical example of your life to faith to life catechesis? Well, for example, in this text here, um, uh, the body of Christ, the church, um, there's a wonderful s chapter in here on the Blessed Trinity. And of course, there has to be. But instead of a more traditional catechesis where you'd begin and you'd explain the Blessed Trinity uh, to the students, and it's a, oh, it's, a, it's a sophomore, junior, high school text, so you should be fairly uh, upgrade. 
in your theology and you'll be talking about circumcision and perichoresis and you'll probably go through you know the great councils and and uh, it's Nicaea but then Constantinople which in a sense uh, makes it more explicit that both Father Son and Holy Spirit are are one God and yet three divine persons and uh, and so on and the circumcision and the relationship between so you do all of that but you see that's not where we begin at all this lesson in here begins by getting young people to talk about their own relationality, their own identity as relational beings. Why are we relational? Why can't we keep to ourselves? Why, why aren't we self-sufficient? Why, why are we made for each other? Why do we need other people? How are your relationships? What kind of relationships are life-giving? What are destructive? How do you know the difference between them? Uh, and, and there's a whole reflection. Of course, there's, you know, there's contemporary music and songs and examples and stories and all kinds of things. Getting people to talk about their own praxis, their own life of relationality and what are life-giving and what are good and bad relationships and dangerous and true and so on, beautiful, life-giving. Uh, it's only after the, reflecting on that aspect, that the great, that generative theme, as Paulo Freire would call it, of relationality, only then do we start talking to them about the relationality of God, that God, even within God's self, is a right and loving relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, <clears throat> and then always toward us, the economic trinity, is a God of right and loving relationship. And if we're made in the image and likeness of a God of right and loving relationship, then obviously this has powerful implications for how we are to live. For so long we taught the trinity as if it is just an old mystery we cannot explain. Now the theologians are saying it's a mystery that explains everything about who our God is and how we are to live as a people of God. So basically then you move back to their own life Okay, if, if you're ever to take seriously the notion of a triune loving God, what does that mean for us? How does it call us to live? How does it empower us to live? What does it model for us? Where does it invite us? What decisions do you need to make in light of the Christian dogma of the triune nature of our one God? And so, in other words, you leave them from life. Now, I'm summarizing, of course, and there's 14 pages of a chapter and so on but you lead them from life to faith and then back hope. I invite them then to a life in faith. What can you tell us of Crato's genesis and development and what sets it apart from other catechetical curriculum? Crato is a response by uh, a wonderful publishing company named Veritas. Veritas is originally owned by the Irish Bishops' Conference, but they have a growing footprint in other parts of the English-speaking world, the United States, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and so on. So Veritas USA took up the challenge that the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops issued when in, 19, in 2007 they published what they called a framework for high school, for a framework for adolescent catechesis. So the U.S. CCB came out with this framework for, the, the com for a comprehensive high school curriculum or for high school age. Now, it's to be used in Catholic schools, uh, theology curricula, but also in parish uh, youth ministry programs and so on. And most people in my field were highly critical of the, of the framework and for good, some good reason. It did look at times like a kind of a very ultra-conservative, ultra-orthodox document. I saw a great potential in it because I saw it having the potential of enabling young people to encounter a cumulative, comprehensive uh, and, uh, story and vision of their Catholic faith. That it, it, it in a kind of a, a properly scoped and sequenced way would give them this sense of a comprehensive, in-depth, access and knowledge of their Catholic Christian tradition and the richness of it and so on. Having taught undergraduates here at Boston College for some 30 years, I, I was often terribly disappointed in the young people who would come into my theology courses and very often they'd have AP in, in science and math, but they'd know precious little about their Catholic faith, even though they'd gone to good Catholic high schools. All they'd have had is, uh, you know, an elective on marriage and something on world religions and something on relationships or who am I? But the comprehensive knowledge wasn't there of Catholic Christian faith. I saw this framework as having that potential. So did Veritas. And in a sense, we got together and we decided that we were going to create a set of curricula. I mean, 
and we've created them painstakingly with great care uh, and, and uh, attention to the detail of the very faithful to the framework that the bishops are requiring. And we found that the framework made us uh, engage in a cumulative. So you begin with the kind of a fundamental theology, God and, and who is our God and how does God reveal God's self in Jesus and so on. And then you move to the life of Jesus and then you move to the Christ of faith and what he achieved and then how the church carries on this mission and then how the sacraments enable us and sustain us to do that and how living the way Jesus taught us, you know, the commitment to the morality and the ethics and the social justice and so on. So there's a great cumulative kind of um, uh, sequencing to it that one book builds upon another and, um, and also a great Christ, a Jesus Christ centeredness to it all. Uh, so the old text very often had a book on Jesus, a book on the church, a book on the sacraments, a book on morality. We have a book on Jesus and then Jesus and the church, Jesus and the sacraments, Jesus and morality. So it's all Christological and Trinitarian in its kind of in its organization. Um, it engages young people's lives with the great generative themes of their lives, but then takes those great themes and brings them to the faith tradition and how this faith tradition can be a great spiritual wisdom for their lives and then invites them to integrate these into their own decision-making and judgments and what to do with it and how to learn from it and maybe even become it, take it on as their own identity. So it's, and then the Ver Veritas has spared nothing in, in publishing these books. They're beautiful books, beautifully designed. I think they're the finest of pedagogy. I think they're the finest of theology, uh, deeply faithful to the teachings of the church and so on, approved now by the bishop's office in Washington. Uh, I think of the seven books we've published, five of them have now been officially approved. The other two are awaiting approval. It's just that they're, it takes time. Um, we have seven books published and we have four more to go because there's, there's a text for each uh, semester of high school and then there's three electives. So uh, it's a huge project, and, uh, but we're getting there. Credo comprises seven books already with four more to come. What are the topics that are presented in the series, Tom, and what logic dictates the order in which those topics are presented? I think the logic of it, the sequencing of it, it, it begins, the first text begins with God, how do we know God, how does God reveal God's self, and so on. So it's a kind of a fundamental theology, and then introduces people to the scriptures, to the tradition, how to interpret the scriptures, how to read the Bible well and intelligently, and placing the text in its context, and placing our text in our context, and so on. So it's a kind of an opening fundamental theology. Then we move to Jesus, the Jesus of history, uh, the historical figure. And now, of course, it's always the Christ of faith. So all of this overlaps. And yet there's a certain uh, sequencing in a logic to doing the Jesus of history. And then we move to, well, what did he achieve? Who is this Christ of faith and the work of our salvation, redemption, liberation, and so on, uh, and the sending of the Holy Spirit and the founding of the church and so on. And then how does the church carry on this mission of Jesus, of God's saving work in Jesus Christ? How does the church continue that? And what does it mean to be church and to be baptized in the church and in the Christian faith? What does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus and so on? And then on into how the sacraments sustain us in living this life and prayer and spirituality and our good spiritual practices and the ethics of it all, the morality by which we are to live, the values, the virtues, the guidelines and so on by which we would live as disciples of Jesus. And all this, the central emphasis running through is what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus? Uh, and that includes being in, a member of the church and celebrating the sacraments and so on. But the emphasis, the focus is on the, sac the discipleship to Jesus. And then the electives, so there there's six opening books, and then the electives pick up from there. There's an elective on scripture. There's an elective on just social justice. Uh, there's a special book. Now, social justice runs all through the, all the series. And likewise, the scriptures are constantly referred to and taught and so on. And yet there's an in-depth uh, text on, on, the, on the Bible, one on social justice, an in-depth text on vocation, uh, 
and the choosing of vocation and different kinds of vocation, uh, an in-depth te text on, um, on world religions, on ecumenism and outreach and conversation, dialogue with other religions, and then an in-depth uh, text on the history of the church. Again, lots of history runs through all of the texts, and yet there is a particular uh, elective on, the, on, the hist on, the, on church history. Um, it's very comprehensive, and, uh, but constantly attempting to engage young people's lives so that they not just learn about history, names, dates, places, battles, or whatever, but that they engage the wisdom of each era, that they bring their own lives to reread that era, to encounter that era, uh, the Reformation, the, the whatever it might, the, medi the me medieval monks and monasteries, what can we learn from them? Rather, what do we learn about them? Uh, what of the monastic tradition is still tremendously life-giving and could be tremendously life-giving in our time and place as well. And so that life-to-faith-to-life type of pedagogy runs through all of the texts, even the ones that people might find challenging to imagine how to do that, but we're finding ways to do it effectively. You're the editor of the Credo series. Who are some of your contributing authors and what unique gifts do they bring to the task? Of the nine texts that we've now completed and the two that are being written, um, there, are about, um, get, uh, there are about 20 authors involved, 20 to 25 authors. Uh, I'm the general editor. I basically, I outline each chapter. Each book has 14 chapters, 13 or 14, typically 14. Uh, each chapter is about 12, 15 pages of print and uh, graphics and design. I originate each chapter with a two or three page outline, and then I farm them out to other authors who write a first draft and give it back to me for editing. I edit, recast, rewrite, combine, whatever, and then pass it on to the publisher. Of those 25 other authors who are working with me, uh, I would say at least uh, 22 of them uh, are people who have either are currently in doctoral studies in religious education or who have completed doctorates in theology and education with us here at Boston College. So they're all Boston College. I think Of the 25, I think there's three that are not Boston College graduates of our PhD in theology and education or soon to be graduates. The advanced doc uh, three or four of my advanced doctoral students are currently authoring texts throughout the summer. And they make some money on it. They get a little, they get some stipend for it, but also it's a resource for them. But far more important, they're influencing uh, rising generations of young uh, Catholic adolescents by way of nurturing them in their faith. And they're very excited about doing that. So this is a BC originated series, uh, lock, stock, and barrel. Tom, you agree with the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which says that home is the first school of Christian life. Many of the students that you hope to reach with the Credo series, though, are coming from homes where faith isn't actively practiced or discussed. Is that a significant impediment? Well, it's a challenge. You know, if the faith is in the home, then you start 10 points ahead. Uh, but... There's lots of evidence that indicates, and lots of research that indicate that uh, a young person who comes from a, a home or a social context that is impoverished of faith uh, can still be touched in their own faith journey within the context of a good Catholic school or a good pastoral ministry, youth ministry program. Uh, there's lots of examples of it. And we've also had examples of young people who got re-engaged with their faith, especially with an effective pedagogy, a pedagogy that makes the faith seem relevant, life-giving, empowering, enabling, liberating uh, for their own lives. When you can get young people convinced of that, they'll very often go home with a different tale to tell to their parents. And we've had lots of examples of students uh, high school students uh, inviting their parents back to reclaim a faith that they may have set aside. Uh, and yet they didn't entirely set it aside. They're still cultural Catholics. It's, otherwise, they wouldn't have their students in Catholic schools. We also have a growing number of Catholic high schools that, are, that have uh, people, students from other faith traditions. 
And that, that poses a particular challenge, but I think a particular opportunity, not in any way to proselytize those students. I know of a high school in Chicago where 89% uh, of the student body are non-Catholic. Only 11% of the students are from some kind of a Catholic context and very often from contexts that may not be actively practicing their faith, maybe cultural Catholics. I think there's still a way to expose young people to the Catholic faith in ways that do, that do not proselytize them and yet they can learn from it for their lives. You see, we've always, uh, we've always thought there's only two ways to teach a faith, either to teach them about it or to get them to become it. And teaching about is like the, well, the, the British uh, Religious Education Act of 1943 mandated religion in, in, in a, all the government-sponsored schools of England and Wales, uh, but they were to teach about it. They weren't to in any way shape people's identity. The other one is to catechize them and to shape their identity. But there is a middle ground where you teach them not just about it, but teach them to learn from it. In other words, you don't interfere with their Buddhist or Muslim or whatever, Baptist identity, and yet you say to them, this is a great rich tradition of spiritual wisdom called Catholicism. You could learn from it for your lives. I think I did it myself here for 30 years at Boston College. I remember I taught a basic course called Catholicism for about 25 years. Catholicism one first semester, Catholicism two second semester. But I'd say to young people in my class, look, I want you to, to be a better uh, Presbyterian or a better Buddhist, a better Jew or McCarthy. You might become a better Catholic uh, from your exposure to this great tradition. And I was flattered. A young man, a young Muslim student came back uh, a year ago. He was here back for his 25th anniversary and he sought me out and he came and he said, Professor, I want to thank you for making me a better Muslim because he said, you said at the beginning of your course in Catholicism that this could enrich my own faith and that my exposure to Catholic Christian faith could, uh, could, could enrich and enhance my own Muslim identity. And he said, I was not an observant Muslim at the time, but I became one by the time I left Boston College. And he said, your own course was a catalyst. I was very flattered. Uh, in other words, even in situations where many people in the classroom are not from vibrantly Catholic homes and sometimes from non-Catholic homes, I still think giving them access to this rich way of being human, of being spiritual, of being Christian, that we call Catholicism, can be a tremendous asset to their lives. How has Credo been received, and what in your mind would constitute success for the series? Credo generally has been very well received. Um, it will be used in about 150 American Catholic high schools this September. Uh, so that's about probably about a quarter of the of the market, to put it that way. Uh, I think that percentage will grow. Uh, it's been slow, uh, but we've done it slowly. You know, we've taken five years to create it. We've done about two books a year. So rather than taking an old curriculum, which some publishers did, and simply recasting it to look as if it's meeting the bishop's uh, framework, we started from scratch and have carefully crafted curricula based on the framework that, and based on good pedagogy and good theology as well. So it, it's been a slow burn, but I think we're making real progress on it. Uh, and I think the people who've been most pleased with the texts are the students. So the feedback we get from students, teachers can find the pedagogy somewhat strange, especially if you're accustomed simply to going into a classroom and simply laying out the faith in a very didactic kind of teaching as telling type of way. So this is a much more participative type of pedagogy. There's lots of room for telling, and there's lots of room for accessing the tradition, the tradition and teaching it clearly, but it's done in the context of young people's lives and for the sake of young people's lives. Some teachers can find of more traditional bent can find that a bit strange. Of course, if they're ever uh, had any good exposure to John Dewey, Paolo Freire, Maria Montessori, any of the great philosophers of education would greatly praise and, and, uh, and indeed bless the pedagogy we're employing. Um, but it's been generally very well received, and especially by the young people who are, find themselves engaged by it. Editing a work of this magnitude is a huge undertaking. What makes it worth the effort? 
I think what makes it worthwhile is giving good textbooks into the hands of teachers. Ultimately, curriculum publishers have a huge influence on what gets taught and therefore on what gets learned. In many ways, education is, is controlled by the curriculum. And so to give teachers a good theologically sound, theologically sophisticated, pedagogically effective, psychologically appropriate to the age level, culturally attuned to youth culture, with lots of examples and echoes and songs and stories and all kinds of, of, of youth culture resonance there as well, bringing young people into their own identity and faith and so on. I think giving teachers quality resources, and these are high quality books, even a flip test through them, you'll see the quality of the, of the graphics, the design, the art and so on. Giving young people, giving teachers that kind of resource, I think strategically, is enormously uh, significant and influential and hopefully will bear, by the grace of God, will bear much fruit. The title of one of your books, Will There Be Faith, recalls Luke chapter 18, verse 8, wherein Jesus reflectively asks that very question about the time when he will return to earth. So let me ask you, as an expert in religious education, will there be faith? Ah, by the grace of God, there will be faith, but we can't take it for granted. It, it, Jesus himself posed the question, when he comes again, will, he find, will the Son of Man find faith on earth? And I think that's become even more urgent in our time. Uh, and we can't be sanguine about it or um, uh, just presume that God will see to it. There's vast areas of our world that once had vibrant Christian communities and no longer are so. Uh, North Africa in the time of Augustine, France, uh, my own native Ireland. I mean, there were parishes in Dublin that had 80% mass attendance only 20 years ago. Now they're down to 10 or 12%. Uh, Quebec, great, you know, f there's all kinds of, th so we can't be, uh, we can't rest on our oars by way of this, of this faith of ours. We have to be proactive. I think we have to be effective in this world. So going back to old ways that were effective one time uh, is just a nostalgia that won't serve us well. But we have to accept the challenge of our time and by God's grace see to it that indeed uh, there will be faith. But uh, it's not something that we can simply presume upon. Uh, there's an old sin of a presumption, and we could readily commit it in this regard. Tom, as a scholar, what value do you place on research libraries and the resources that they provide? Ah, they're our lifeblood. The, re the libraries are our lifeblood. I mean, we couldn't do the work we do without them. And uh, I mean, we're so blessed here at Boston College to have such rich uh, resources, especially theological resources. There's probably, if you combine the resources of O'Neill with the uh, uh, Library of the Theology and Mis School of Theology and Ministry, um, I mean, we have the, probably the finest library, theological library, anywhere in the world. And uh, it's a huge asset. I mean, and for writing high school curriculum, people might think, well, that's kind of watered down theology. No, it's not. It's the best of good theology, now articulated at a language level and so on, that is, is comprehensible to students because, as Aquinas would insist, all good communication has to be according to the mode of the receiver. But what's in these texts are the best of good theology, and the only way we can be sure that it is the best of good theology if we have the library resources to draw upon and to readily access uh, so that, indeed, uh, we are putting out there to our young people what is, in fact, the best mind of the church at this point in time.